Block 1, Unit 1, Introduction to Cancer. Cancer can be defined as a disease in which a group of abnormal cells grow uncontrollably by disregarding the normal rules of cell division. Normal cells are constantly subject to signals that dictate whether the cell should divide, differentiate into another cell, or die. Cancer cells develop a degree of autonomy from these signals, resulting in uncontrolled growth and proliferation. If this proliferation is allowed to continue and spread, it can be fatal. In fact, almost 90% of cancer-related deaths are due to tumor spreading, a process called metastasis. The foundation of modern cancer biology rests on a simple principle. Virtually all mammalian cells share similar molecular networks that control cell proliferation, differentiation, and cell death. The prevailing theory which underpins research into the genesis and treatment of cancer is that normal cells are transformed into cancers as a result of changes in these networks at a molecular, biochemical, and cellular level. And for each cell, there's a finite number of ways this disruption can occur. Phenomenal advances in cancer research in the past 50 years have given us an insight into how cancer cells develop this autonomy. We now define cancer as a disease that involves changes or mutations in the cell genome. These changes, DNA mutations, produce proteins that disrupt the delicate cellular balance between cell division and quiescence, resulting in cells that keep dividing to form cancers. Current dogma states that cancer is a multi-gene, multi-step disease originating from a single abnormal cell, clonal origin, with an altered DNA sequence or mutation. Uncontrolled proliferation of these abnormal cells is followed by a second mutation, leading to the mildly aberrant stage. Successive rounds of mutation and selective expansion of these cells results in the formation of a tumor mass. Subsequent rounds of mutation and expansion leads to tumor growth and progression, which eventually breaks through the basal membrane barrier surrounding tissues and spreads to other parts of the body, metastasis. Death as a result of cancer is due to the invading, eroding, and spreading of tumors into normal tissues due to uncontrolled clonal expansion of these somatic cells. Initiation and progression of cancer depends on both external factors in the environment, like tobacco, chemicals, radiation, and infectious organisms, and factors within the cell, inherited mutations, hormones, immune conditions, and mutations that occur from metabolism. These factors can act together or in sequence, resulting in abnormal cell behavior and excessive proliferation. As a result, cell masses grow and expand, affecting surrounding normal tissues, such as in the brain, and can also spread to other locations in the body, metastasis. However, it's important to remember that most common cancers take months and years for these DNA mutations to accumulate and result in a detectable cancer. Cancers arise approximately one in every two individuals. DNA mutations arise normally at a frequency of 1 in every 20 million per gene per cell division. The average number of cells formed in any individual during a lifetime is 10 million cells being replaced every second. It would therefore be logical to assume that human populations anywhere in the world would show similar frequencies of cancer. However, cancer incidence rates, number of individuals diagnosed, vary dramatically across countries. Evidently, some factors seem to intervene to dramatically increase cancer incidence in some populations. The obvious interference is that contributory factors that cause cancer are either hereditary or environmental. It means that either certain populations carry a large number of cancer susceptibility genes, or that the environment in which populations live largely contribute to the cancer incidence rates. Causes of cancer etiology of cancer. Which of the two, genes or the environment, play a dominant role in developing cancer? While genes are distributed unequally across populations, they do not explain the differences in cancer incidence rates in the world. This is demonstrated most dramatically in this example. Incidences of stomach cancers are six to eight times higher among Japanese compared to Americans. However, children of migrant Japanese settled in America show incident rates of stomach cancer comparable to that of the American population. Therefore, the risk of developing cancer seems largely environmental, accounting for more than 90% of all cancers caused. Lifestyle and environment. 
The first known report linking the influence of lifestyle on cancer was by John Hill, an English physician who noted the link between nasal cancer and the use of tobacco snuff. In the late 18th century, Sir Percival Pott reported that scrotal cancer in chimney sweeps was linked to poor hygiene and accumulation of cancer-causing agents from soot. The Danish Chimney Sweepers Guild recommended daily baths and was the most likely reason for the dramatic reduction in scrotal cancer incidence rates in Europe. In 1950, compelling epidemiological evidence showed that heavy cigarette smokers ran a 20-fold higher risk of developing lung cancer compared to non-smokers. Since then, tobacco and alcohol consumption have been linked to almost 170,000 mouth and throat cancer deaths per year in the U.S. alone. Over half a million deaths every year are expected to be caused by lifestyle choices such as obesity, physical inactivity, diets low in vegetables, high in salt or nitrates, are linked to stomach and esophageal cancers, whereas high-fat, low-fiber diets are linked to bowel, pancreatic, breast, and prostate cancer. Risk of cancers is also increased by infectious agents, including viruses, hepatitis B virus, human papillomavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, increased risk of nasopharyngeal, cervical carcinomas, and Kaposi's sarcoma, and bacteria such as Heliobacter pylori, stomach cancers. Incidences of skin cancers or melanomas are on the rise, especially in Australia, due to exposure to high levels of UV radiation in the sun's rays and popularity of tanning salons. However, the risk of developing some of these cancers can be reduced by changing lifestyles and vaccines, like Gardasil, which reduces the risk of cervical carcinomas. Initiation and progression of cancer is also due to exposure to cancer-causing agents, carcinogens or mutagens. These are present in food and water, in the air, and in chemicals and sunlight that people are exposed to. Since epithelial cells cover the skin, line the respiratory and alimentary tracts, and metabolize ingested carcinogens, it is not surprising that over 90% of cancers originate from epithelia, carcinomas. In less than 10% of cases, a genetic predisposition increases the risk of cancer developing a lot earlier, like childhood leukemias or retinal cancers. Although cancer can occur in persons of every age, it is common among the aging population. 60% of new cancer cases and two-thirds of cancer deaths occur in people greater than 65 years. The incidence of common cancers like breast, colorectal, prostate, and lung increases with age. There are several theories as to why cancer incidence increases in the elderly. Age-related alterations in the immune system, decreased immune surveillance, accumulation of random genetic mutations or lifetime carcinogen exposure, especially for colorectal and lung cancers hormonal alterations or exposure, and long lifespans. Multiple genetic changes are necessary for the development of cancer, most clearly exemplified by the stepwise genetic changes shown by many colon polyps progressing to cancer. The exponential rise in many cancers with age fits with the increased susceptibility to the late stages of carcinogenesis by environmental exposures. Lifetime exposure to estrogen may lead to breast or uterine cancer, Exposure to testosterone leads to prostate cancer. The decline in cellular immunity may also lead to certain types of cancer that are highly immunogenic, like lymphomas or melanomas. Accumulation of DNA mutations has been amplified to constitute a cancer. Therefore, the longer the lifespan, the higher the risk of developing cancer. There are more than 100 distinct types of cancer, and any specific organ can contain tumors of more than one subtype. This provokes several questions. How many of these regulatory circuits need to be broken to transform a normal cell into a cancerous one? Is there a common regulatory circuit that's broken among the different types of cancers? Which of these circuits are broken inside a cell, and which of these are linked to extreme signals from neighboring cells in the tissue? The answer to these questions can be summarized in a heterotypic model manifested as the six common changes in cell physiology that results in cancer proposed by Douglas Hanahan and Robert Weinberg in 2000. This model looks at tumors as complex tissues in which cancer cells recruit and use normal cells in order to enhance their own survival and proliferation. The six hallmarks of this currently accepted model can be described using a traffic light analogy. One, immortality. 
continuous cell division and limitless replication. Two, produce go signals or growth factors from oncogenes. Three, override stop signals, anti-growth signals from tumor suppressor genes. Four, resistance to cell death or apoptosis. Five, angiogenesis, the induction of new blood vessel growth. And six, metastasis, spread to other sites. Cell signaling. It is impossible to talk about growth factors in cancer without going over some of the basics of cell signaling. We are multicellular animals, and as such, our cells need to communicate with each other so that they can act in a coordinated manner in response to the environment. The basis of this communication comes from a process known as cell signaling. Growth factors are, simply put, substances that control the multiplication of cells. There are many different types of growth factors, but they all have several characteristics in common. They are proteins, and they're present at very low concentrations in tissues with a high biological activity. They are responsible for controlling essential functions within the cell, growth, specialization, and survival. Growth factors also do not circulate in the bloodstream. Instead, they act locally in areas near the cells that produce them. The behavior of a cell depends on its immediate surrounding environment, known as the microenvironment. The assortment of growth factors in this microenvironment is the most important aspect regulating the behavior of that cell. All growth factors exert their effects by binding to a receptor. Receptors are proteins found on the surface of a cell that receive such chemical signals from the outside of the cell. Each growth factor has its own receptor. Think of it as a key, the growth factor fitting into a lock, the receptor. Growth factor receptors tend to be transmembrane molecules. This means that one end of the receptor sticks out through the cell membrane into the microenvironment, while the other end projects inside the cell. By spanning across the cell membrane, growth factor receptors are able to communicate signals from the outside of the cell, for example, the presence of growth factors in the microenvironment, to the inside of the cell. Revisiting the lock and key analogy, think of it as a key that fits into a lock that protrudes through the door frame instead of being flush against the door. The binding of the growth factor to its specific receptor triggers a phosphorylation reaction inside the cell. Phosphorylation, or the addition of a phosphate group to a protein molecule, is an important step in cell signaling. This is because many proteins exist in an on or off state that can be switched by phosphorylation. Therefore, phosphorylation is a key step in regulating their activity. The enzymes that add phosphate groups to proteins are known as kinases. Enzymes that remove phosphates are known as phosphatases. The exterior end of the receptor protein, the bit that sticks out of the cell, carries the growth factor binding site. The other end, which projects inside the cell, carries a kinase site. Binding of growth factor to the receptor binding site activates the kinase domain on the interior end of the receptor protein. This activated kinase, true to its name, then goes on to add phosphate groups to other proteins inside the cell, which then activate more proteins downstream, triggering a signaling cascade that finally ends with the activation of genes that bring about you guessed it, cellular growth, specialization, and survival. This description is an extremely simplified version of what happens inside a cell. In reality, it's not so much a linear signaling pathway as it is an interwoven, intricate signaling web with promiscuous proteins from many different pathways activating and repressing one another. So now that we understand the basics of the molecular mechanisms behind cell signaling, what happens in a cancer cell that turns this orderly process so horribly awry? As you may have figured out, normal cells cannot divide without the go-ahead from growth factors. Even normal cells growing in a petri dish need growth factors supplied from animal serum to divide. If not, they enter a dormant state and eventually die. Cancer cells, on the other hand, do not need this go-ahead. This liberation from being dependent on externally supplied growth factors removes a very critical checkpoint on the path toward cancer. Breaching the defenses. 
How do cancer cells bypass this checkpoint? There are three common strategies. First, they can alter the level of growth signal itself. Normally, growth factors are made by one type of cell in order to act on another type of cell. However, many cancer cells acquire the ability to synthesize and secrete their own growth factors, stimulating others of their kind, which creates a feedback loop in which more cancer cells divide under the influence of growth factors to synthesize more growth factor, and so on. If the key to the lock is typically provided by a caretaker, then this means your own DIY key cutting machine so that dependence on the locksmith is eliminated. Second, the cancer can tweak the growth factor receptor itself so that a larger than normal number of these receptors are present on the surface of the cancer cell. This means that the cancer cell becomes hyper-responsive to ambient levels of growth factor that would normally not be enough to trigger cell division. Additionally, in some tumors, the growth factor receptor is structurally altered, sometimes lacking the regulatory regions, which results in the switch being permanently stuck at on. There is no need for a key, the lock opens without one. Finally, there are alterations further downstream of the signaling pathway, so that the requirement for growth factor and receptor are both bypassed. For example, one of the key downstream components of the growth factor signaling pathway is a protein kinase known as RAS. Mutant RAS is permanently switched on. Mutant RAS is the most common gene in human cancer. 25% of all human tumors and up to 90% of cer certain types of cancer, such as pancreatic cancer, have mutant RAS. Why bother with trying to unlock the door if the walls don't exist? It's worth remembering that cancer cells cannot do what they do in isolation. The apparently normal bystanders, such as the cells of the nearby blood vessels and connective tissue, must also play a role in driving cancer cell growth. In normal tissue, cells are instructed to grow by their neighbors. This is true of the tumor microenvironment as well. A tumor is not only made of cancer cells. Tumors should be regarded as complex tissues in which the mutant cancer cells have co-opted and subverted normal neighbor cells by inducing them to release growth factors as well. With these three strategies for achieving self-sufficiency and growth signals, Cancer cells can successfully breach one of the anti-cancer defenses hardwired in our normal cells. The result is cells that are capable of growing uncontrollably, unstoppably, and pathologically. In other words, cancer cells. Evading growth suppressors. Some background information about the cell cycle. Think of the cell cycle as the control system of a washing machine. A washing machine passes through several stages in a wash cycle soaking the clothes, adding detergent at the correct time, agitating the clothes based on the level of dirt, rinsing the clothes for the appropriate duration to remove the detergent, adding the fabric softener at the correct time, a final rinse, and then spinning the clothes to remove as much water as possible. In much the same way, the cell cycle is a series of tightly regulated events inside a cell that leads to its division into two daughter cells. In between these start and end states, the DNA inside the parent cell needs to be double and then be divided equally between the two daughter cells. Intricate feedback loops of responsive proteins trigger events in the cell cycle, guiding the cell through checkpoints that lie between every stage. These checkpoints are important because they act as safety valves, ensuring that an errant incorrectly dividing cell with damaged DNA is promptly whisked away and destroyed rather than allowed to continue its life. We will discuss the details of the cell cycle and checkpoints in Unit 5. Resisting cell death. The apoptotic program is hardwired into every single cell in our body. It is like a cyanide capsule swiftly delivering death if the circumstances require cellular suicide. If a cell detects that it has damaged DNA, it can activate apoptosis to remove itself from the population. Apoptosis, or cellular suicide, is an entirely normal function of cells. The same apoptotic program is activated when a tadpole changes into a frog. The cells in the tail die through apoptosis and the tail disappears. The same is true for the webbing between our fingers and our early embryonic development. Apoptosis is an extremely tidy process. Cellular membranes are disrupted, the chromosomes are degraded, the DNA breaks up into fragments, 
and the dying, shrinking cell is swallowed up by a neighboring cell or a patrolling immune cell, leaving no trace of the cellular suicide behind. So how does apoptosis work at a molecular level? The apoptotic machinery can be divided into two broad categories, regulators and effectors. The regulators are responsible for monitoring the interior and exterior environment of the cell for conditions of abnormality in order to decide whether that cell should live or die. The possible abnormalities include DNA damage, signaling imbalances caused by the activation of cancer-causing genes or oncogenes, a lack of an oxygen supply, or insufficient growth factors. Apoptosis can therefore occur either through an intrinsic pathway in which signals from within the cell activate the process or through an extrinsic pathway where death signals from outside of the cell are received and processed by the cell to activate apoptosis. It is thought that the intrinsic apoptotic pathway is more important in cancer prevention than the extrinsic pathway. Given how our cells carry machinery to destroy themselves with the precision of an executioner, it comes as no surprise that the process is tightly regulated. So how do cancer cells escape death? The most common method is the loss of the apoptotic gatekeeper, the protein P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. More than half of all types of human cancers have a mutated or missing gene for P53, resulting in a damaged or missing P53 protein. As an alternative to achieving the loss of P53, cancer cells can compromise the activity of P53 by increasing the inhibitors of P53 or silencing the activation of P53. The first three hallmarks of cancer explain how independence from growth signals, insensitivity to anti-growth signals, and resistance to apoptosis lead to the uncoupling of a cell's growth program from the signals in its environment. However, cancer is not just the result of disrupted signaling. Our cells carry a built-in, autonomous program that limits their multiplication, even in the face of disrupted signals from their environment. For a single cancer cell to develop into a visible tumor, this program must also be disrupted. Normal cells are hardwired with a timer that keeps track of their age, the number of times they divide and grow. Most cells in our body can only undergo a limited number of successive cell division and growth cycles. This limit is named the Hayflick limit after its discoverer, Leonard Hayflick. After undergoing between 40 and 60 divisions, cell growth slows down and eventually stops altogether. This state is known as senescence and it is irreversible. Although the cell does not grow or divide, it remains alive. When normal human cells are cultured in the lab in a petri dish, we can observe this phenomenon, where cells grow and divide a fixed number of times and then enter senescence. Some cells are able to make it past the senescence barrier and continue dividing. However, these cells then undergo a second phenomenon known as crisis, during which the ends of the chromosomes fuse with each other and the cells all die on a massive scale via apoptosis. How does a cell count its divisions? How does it know when to stop? The answer is telomeres. Telomeres are regions of repetitive DNA capping and protecting the ends of the chromosomes from degrading or from fusing with other chromosomes. Without telomeres, each time a cell divides, our genomes would progressively lose information because the chromosomes would get shorter and shorter. A telomere is like a heat shield of a spacecraft. It protects the actual spacecraft and absorbs the damage instead. With every replication of a cell, about 50 to 100 nucleotides of telomeric DNA is lost. This progressive loss eventually causes the telomere to lose their ability to protect the ends of chromosomal DNA. Left unprotected, these exposed ends become damaged. The DNA damage response is activated, leading to growth arrest or senescence. When chromosome ends fuse with each other, this irreversible damage results in the activation of apoptosis, and the cells enter crisis and die. When cells are grown in a petri dish in the lab, repeated cycles of cell division lead first to senescence and then for those cells that make it past this barrier to crisis phase. Fascinatingly, in very rare instances, about 1 in 10 to the 7th cells 
a cell can emerge from this ordeal, exhibiting unlimited replicative potential. This cell is now said to be immortalized, and it is a trait that most cancer cells growing in labs exhibit, including the famous HeLa cells. Cancer cells have therefore not only uncoupled their growth program from the signals in their environment, they have also breached the inbuilt replication limit hardwired into the cells. How do they achieve this? All cancer cells maintain their telomeres. 90% of them do so by increasing the production of an enzyme known as telomerase. As its name implies, telomerase functions by adding telomeric DNA to the ends of chromosomes. Most normal cells do not divide frequently and therefore are not in any danger of shortened telomeres. These cells can get away with having low telomerase activity. Indeed, most cells apart from fetal cells and stem cells show low telomerase activity levels. Many cancer-causing proteins, or oncoproteins, are able to activate the production of telomerase, while many cancer-preventing proteins like tumor suppressors, such as p53, produce factors that inhibit the production of telomerase. The other 10% of cancers rely upon the activation of a pathway known as the alternative lengthening of telomeres, or ALT, which swaps around telomeres to lengthen them. In a developing embryo, or a healing wound, communities of cells organize themselves into tissue, undertaking specialized tasks beyond the ability of any single cell to accomplish. These tissues require oxygen and nutrients, as well as a facility to remove metabolic wastes and carbon dioxide. The formation of new blood vessels known as angiogenesis satisfies these needs. In a similar manner, a growing tumor, an aggregation of cancerous cells, also requires access to oxygen, nutrients, and waste disposal. Beyond a certain size, typically one millimeter, diffusion alone is insufficient for providing these necessities. The surface area to volume ratio becomes too low and the developing tumor begins to starve. In response, cancer cells send out signals to the cells of nearby blood vessels, inducing these innocent bystanders to grow extensions to form a supply chain and drainage channels. Thus, the cancer cells subvert these normal neighboring cells into playing a key role in driving tumor development. Angiogenesis is a normal, essential process in the formation and development of embryonic tissues. In the course of normal development, the arrangement of our blood vessels is fixed. Angiogenesis is switched off. In adults, angiogenesis is only switched on during physiological processes such as wound healing or menstruation, and then only transiently and regulated extremely carefully. In contrast, cancer cells always have angiogenesis switched on. So how do cancer cells activate the angiogenic switch? Simply put, they change the balance of angiogenesis inducers and counteracting inhibitors the surrounding cellular environment. The rapid growth of a tumor results in an oxygen delivery problem. Cells found toward the inside of the tumor are deprived of the adequate supply of oxygen. These cells are now said to be hypoxic and activate the hypoxia stress response. The primary response to hypoxia is mediated at the cellular level by the hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF. HIF is a transcription factor initiating the production of other proteins required to mediate the effects of hypoxia. Accumulated HIF transports into the nucleus of the cell, where it induces the expression of numerous target genes that shift the balance of angiogenesis inducers and inhibitors thereby switching on angiogenesis. In normal tissues, communities of cells instruct each other to grow through signaling pathways. The tumor microenvironment hijacks those self-same pathways to divide and grow uncontrollably. A cancer cell cannot function in isolation. It is dependent on the surrounding cells, the innocent bystanders that faithfully respond to the malevolent signals that cancer cells use to achieve their uncontrolled growth. The angiogenesis within the context of a tumor is a warped, twisted version of what it should be. The vessels are convoluted and excessively branched. They're distorted and enlarged with erratic blood flow and leakage. Tumors are messy and bloody, a result of the angiogenesis that sustains them. Angiogenesis in a cancer is a perversion of a normal cellular process, 
a perversion that is an essential requirement for the development of cancer. A growing tumor will eventually spawn pioneer cells. These move out of the original clump of mutant cells to invade adjacent tissue and then travel to distant sites where they form new colonies. These distant settlements of cancer cells are named metastases, and with the exception of leukemias and some brain tumors, cause the majority of cancer deaths. Metastasis is bad news, with significantly reduced survival rates and prognosis for patients. The ability to metastasize allows cancer cells to find new areas of the body where space and nutrients are not limited. In biology, a tissue is an aggregation of cells that perform a specific function. Tissues combine to form organs. Organs combine to form a body. Our tissues are composed primarily of two types of cells, epithelial and mesenchymal cells. Epithelial cells adhere to one another to form cell layers, which act as barriers to protect our bodies and organs from the environment. In contrast, mesenchymal cells are solitary and capable of migrating. Our tissues are not made up solely of cells. A large proportion of tissue consists of extracellular space, which is filled with a mixture of carbohydrate and protein molecules. This space is known as the extracellular matrix, or the ECM. The molecules that make up the ECM are secreted by cells embedded in it, and these cells tether themselves to the ECM and to one another to form tissues. Metastasis therefore requires the untethering of these bonds to allow predaceous cancer cells to migrate freely. What are the traits of the migrating cancer cells? These cells change their appearance from a neat, orderly cobblestone-like of shape to spindly long and long-limbed. The cells also untether themselves from the ECM by expressing proteins that degrade the ECM, notably matrix metalloproteinase, an enzyme that degrades the matrix. A metastatic cancer cell has increased motility and is resistant to apoptosis. These traits occur through the activation of a cellular program that promotes migration, and the molecular mechanism for this program has been identified only recently, within the last decade. What is the molecular mechanism for cell migration? Under normal circumstances, cells migrate through embryonic development and in response to inflammation. The primary pathway involved in this process is an important developmental program known as the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT. EMT is a cellular process or program that has been known in the context of embryonic development for many years. Epithelial cells can be defined as surface cells that display a distinct polarity, that is, knowing which way is up, because of being tethered to one another and the underlying ECM. In contrast, mesenchymal cells are loosely packed, have no polarity, and are able to migrate freely. During embryonic development, epithelial cells are able to undergo physical and genetic changes collectively referred to as epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT. This occurs through the degradation of the ECM, dissolution of E. cadherin, and other cell adhesion junctions, and the loss of cell polarity, resulting in the formation of migratory mesenchymal cells that have invasive properties. These cells are then recruited to specific sites in the developing embryo, where they can revert back through MET, the reverse of EMT, mesenchymal to epithelial transition, to form epithelial tissues at distal locations. Cancer cells hijack this process, first to enable metastasis through activation of the EMT program, and then, once they reach their new home, to revert back to epithelial form by activating the MET program. Thus, although the EMT, MET program, has been known of in the context of embryonic development for many years, it's only recently that the significance of this EMT, MET program to cancer progression has been recognized. Intriguingly, tumors can also possess cancer stem cells. These cells are highly capable of forming tumors. They are thought to persist in tumors as a distinct population of cells and cause relapse and metastasis by forming new tumors. Even a single cancer stem cell can give rise to an entire tumor and worryingly seem resistant to chemotherapy. Recent evidence indicates that a cancer cell that's undergone EMT is in fact a cancer stem cell. 
Metastasis has been traditionally thought of as the final stage of a burgeoning tumor. Indeed, our current classification system for a tumor upon diagnosis assigns a higher value when there's evidence of metastasis. We used to think that cancer cells pass through multiple successive mutations, growing in size, eventually sending away migratory cells to set up shop elsewhere. Dismayingly, recent evidence suggests that metastasis does not necessarily happen in the final stages of cancer progression, but can occur at any time sometimes even before the primary tumor is observed. The ability to invade and metastasize distant sites is a key hallmark of cancer progression and possibly one of the most complicated and least understood hallmarks so far.